We fear that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. Ne olan tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı. Ne fazla ne az. Pent up feelings that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. Get a lot of killers. Why well, you think our country so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello and welcome to Bar and Blog. And today I'm here with Ralph Rudkus. If you uh, speak German, he's recently been on uh, 99.9s um, and you can probably get some more information there but you do have to actually speak german so um we're going to be talking about his book the uh the communist road to capitalism um and the situation in china as it seems today um and when i asked you on the show i thought i was going to be asking you a completely different set of questions than what i sat down and wrote uh um because Right now, geopolitics is a rapidly moving target. Um, but uh, let's start with the with the basic premise of the book. I I think on the on the U.S. Uh, left, there has been a resurgence of interest in China, particularly in the last three to four years. Um, some of that seems to come out of the general anti-Chinese mood um, of of the media and the government here, which has been a kind of slow burning development, probably all the way back to the second Obama administration. Um, but that has led to a lot of people to kind of assert that modern China, contemporary China is not capitalist. Um, and yeah, your book, which was released by PM press uh, definitely argues differently, but you don't, I, I actually think you don't take the standard argument that maybe it was always state capitalist or anything like that. You, you seem to talk about these kind of revolts and containments. So let's go into that a little bit. Uh, you have stated that that while Chinese capitalism is capitalism, that it is actually pretty significantly different than Western capitalism. Like the, the capitalism with, uh, with Chinese characteristics and socialism with Chinese characteristics is something different than, say, Western capitalism. I mean, maybe even Western state capitalism during wartime. What do you see as the key differences? Yeah, first you, you pointed out already, right? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, when I talk about Chinese capitalism or the recent Chinese capitalism, I'm talking about the period of the last like 20, 25 years and mm -hmm. not earlier on. And so we can go into that later maybe, but just stay with the, with the, with the argument on, on capitalism. What is capitalism? I think that um, first of all, we have to see that, you know, there's not just one capitalism, like this idea that, you know, all capitalisms are the same. I don't share that. And even if you compare, let's say, the German model and the U.S. model, you would see a lot of differences there already. Um, so it's not so unusual to find another capitalism, right, elsewhere in the world. Um, the Chinese capitalism, I think, is very much uh, based on, or, or let's say it's, it's influenced uh, by legacies from the socialist period, legacies in terms of institutions and practices that were adapted um, and changed to uh, when, when you know, after or through the transition to capitalism. For instance, the, um, you know, the Chinese regime still uses long-term economic planning. It's not the same planning as during socialist times, but it is definitely different from planning in other, in other capitalisms, let's say a lot more like long-term, you know, based on like goals for the next 20, 30 years, stuff like that. Then you have still have a very strong uh, state sector. So when the economy was restructured uh, in the 90s, um, you know the, the certain strategic uh, sectors 
um, uh, state state owned, like the large parts of financial sector, energy sector, communication sector, and others. Um, and you know, while you have that in other parts of the world, like you know, large state sectors, you know, this is like so to keep like strategic sectors in this sense is is um, is fairly unique. And uh, one of the sectors I mentioned is financial sector, and I think that's very important because the currency is still not convertible. Because stock market is highly controlled, so in, in some sense, the uh, Chinese economy is less sensitive to market changes domestically and globally. Or you could also say the government has more means to intervene into certain processes, um, and it does that. And also, you know, it doesn't just intervene into economic processes in general, but also in in, uh, in like social confrontations, um, social confrontations in workplaces as well, where they uh, CCP, the Chinese Communist Party sells uh, play a role or the local state authorities and they intervene directly into social struggles. However, and, and you enter that, I think that it's important also to, to state the similarities, right? Like um, why do I think China is clearly capitalist? And I think that's because the eco economic activities, the state and the private activities clearly aim for the accumulation of capital and that relies on the exploitation of workers and the extraction of surplus value and um, these processes reproduce capitalist social relations um, between a working class and a capitalist class a capitalist class that's you know heavily influenced or carried by state actors as well so i think that's that's also important to state one of the things that your book points out and you've also pointed out in interviews um is that to think of this as just a billionaire one percent project though is also kind of mischaracterizing the situation right that that, that about 20 to 30 percent of the population broadly supports this shift because it has actually benefited them can you go into the dynamics of that a little bit yeah th i mean you know there's a misinterpretation <laughs> that uh authoritarian regimes are just you know like whatever governed from above and they don't care about legitimacy or they don't have to sort of take care that a part of the population supports them. I, I think that's not how authoritarianism works, and especially not in a country with 1.4 billion people and, and you know, the vast country, with, which which actually is, is hard to govern in, 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 the, in from, a, from a, you know, central uh, city like Beijing. Uh, anyway, so they, they need to, uh, the CCP needs to and has of course, has a long history of that, even in socialist times of um, sort of mobilizing parts of the population. And one part of the mobilization is obviously ideology. We could, we could talk about that, how that changed. But one is important aspect is, of course, um, the economic, the material situation um, of, of, of the people, their livelihood. And, and um, in the last 30 years or so, there has definitely been an economic boom, as everyone knows. In China, it benefited most, um, you know, sort of a, a, like a layer of we would call, maybe call it middle class. Although there's, I see some differences there, like using that term in comparison to maybe the U.S. or Europe, but a middle class that uh, mostly urban middle class that has benefited a lot from the economic changes um, in terms of, of living standards, and a lot of them um, actually support. Um, the the the, um, the the regime, um, but my, you, we must also see right. The regime was also successful in sort of not allowing any other like alternative power group to to develop right. And so there's a, there's not really a, like even for let's say people who support Chinese capitalism, there's not really an alternative uh, different from from other parts of the world right, where where you often have like sort of a a struggle between different maybe sections of the capitalist class or political um, entities or parties, and you don't have that in China. Mm. So one thing I think this this leads me to ask: you, your book talks a lot about how containment drived this uh, these developments, these economic developments that the the that the CPC really was responding to various even organic, you know, working class peasant movements, et cetera, in, in China. Uh, 
Um, you talk specifically about the revolution within the revolution. And I, I found this interesting because um, I've talked to uh, Dong Ping Han, who has a, a much more pro view of China contemporaneously, but actually echoes a lot of the things you say in the book, particularly in his criticisms of the Dungus period. Um, what do you think drove the cultural revolution to a point where containment was would drive it capitalist i know this is the main bulk of your book but you know what's the kind of the the short form here well then if we look at the cultural revolution right so the, this idea of the revolution and the revolution was is mostly based on that argument on the cultural revolution and i draw on, on also on other arguments by, by Wu Qing, for instance and others yeah, here. So I think that, you know, one of the misperceptions of the cultural revolution is that it was just like one big movement for like sort of a renewal, or, um, you know, sort of a new form of, of revolutionizing Chinese society. But that, you know, there, there, that and maybe people, you know, remember there was a conservative sort of part and uh, like conservative red guards and like rebel red guards and they kind of uh, fought. Um, and then there are ideas that, you know, the conservative forces wanted to defend sort of the old, um, you know, the sort of the, the faction around uh, Liu uh, Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping, while the rebels wanted to revolutionize China, um, uh, you, know, you know, of course, uh, uh, under, under the reign of, of Mao Zedong. But, but my argument is, and I follow others here, is that, you know, there was another sort of struggle within this setting where um, parts of the sort of marginalized, exploited um, working classes, proletarians, but also peasants, rusticated people who were sent to the countryside, people who were branded in, in campaigns, actually used the Cultural Revolution, sort of the situation, unprecedented situation where the regime allowed people to organize and demonstrate and, you know, um, just sort of organize an uprising in that sense. And even and publish, you know, publish um, um, pamphlets and, and flyers and books, etc. There's something that didn't happen before and, and hardly happened after. So people use that um, to organize their own, um, their own groups, temporary workers, um, apprentices, like, you know, people, like a lot of people um, in, in the urban areas who um, didn't benefit from what was later called the Iron Rice Bowl, sort of the set of welfare, social welfare, um, but did actually feel exploited and had a very poor life uh, at the point. And so that sort of, you know, revolution, let's say, or that mobilization, um, you know, that, that posed a lot of like like demands for changes, economic changes, material changes. But basically, they wanted the same welfare <laughs> or the same like permanent jobs and guarantees. Um, and um, and the faction around Mao and others, they 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 call them like the economists, right? The economists win and they fought against them because they saw that as a threat to the socialist setup, like the hierarchical sort of class structure. Although they wouldn't call it, I I call it. <laughs> class structure um, and so the revolution within the revolution posed a big threat and as we know you know the party kind of dissolved a lot of mass organizations the union etc et dissolved and the, you know through these fights between different groups in in uh, during the cultural revolution so there was a big threat um, for the existence of the socialist um, regime as such and the continuation of the project um, and at the same time which is very interesting to read as well is there were parts of this rebel movement from, from below. Um, and they formulated a very radical critique of, um, of the socialist class society, right? They called it the, the leadership of the red bourgeoisie and um, the demand like, like improvements, changes. And maybe like we could say like, that because they are also, also referring a lot to the Paris Commune and sort of ideas of, a, of an egalitarian society. So they formulated the aim of a new, real, let's say, revolutionary society. And that threatened, obviously, the, the regime. Um, and eventually it called in the, like the army, right? So the, the mobilizations, as well as the critique, um, provoked um, the use of the army to finish off the, the whole movement, right? Um, you know, I cut it short, of course, I simplified it, but, but 
I think this revolution within the revolution played a major role. You said like, um, you know, this led kind of directly to, or you kind of what you said implies that it directly led to the, I think it, it did in a historical sense over a span of roughly 30 years, right? But, but it wasn't a direct sort of um, development. I think that, you know, the, definitely the regime after that experience um, of, of the Cultural Revolution knew it had to reform. But, you know, the reform, and there were plans, like this is interesting, right? So the plans for the reforms that were carried out after 78, which, you know, most people know that's when officially the reform started, but the plans, you know, sort of the, the concrete measures were already planned in the early 70s and um, they were just not carried out. They were not implemented because there was a factional fight within the leadership and only after the Mao's death in 76 and then the coup against the so-called Gang of Four, there was a chance for the reform sec uh, faction around Deng Xiaoping to take over and finally carry out this these reforms. Another thing is that, you know, like because especially Mao is, or people who are still are sort of, you know, supporting Maoism today, let's say the cultural revolution sort of idea of Maoism, um, they often said that, um, say that, you know, Deng Xiaoping was, they call, they call, they use the term capitalist roader. Mm -hmm. So, you know, someone that, that went to uh, capitalist road. There was a term used in the 60s already. Right. For people like Lu Xiaoqi and stuff, correct? Yeah, exactly. For that faction. I, I, and, you know, I think that, that that's also a misperception that they planned in 70, whatever, in 71 or in 78, the transition to capitalism. I don't think that. I think they wanted an adaption, adaptation. They, want, they wanted to change socialist structures um, to, you know, to strengthen them, to, to uh, you know, sort of learn from experiences and, like, create a like a, um, a system, a socialist system that would function better. Um, and they, you know, so they introduced certain, you know, you know, measures like they, they imported foreign technology they didn't have and thought they needed. Um, you know, they, 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 later they invited foreign capital to, to, to invest. They opened up chances for people to engage in private business, et cetera. But, I don't think that you can say that um, they planned capitalism, right? They planned the transition. That is something that I think that was only decided after the next large mobilization in, 90, in 89 and large uprising where the regime again used the, again used the army. Um, and then in the early 90s, I think that's when they made the decision, okay, you know, we, we need to go further. This is not working. And because also the first reforms created a lot of, like, they created improvements, but also in crises, economic mm. crises, social crises. So um, I don't think there's a direct line, let's say, from cultural revolution, uh, the revolution in the revolution to, you know, the step to introduce capitalism. But there's a historical, let's say, transition that starts and then kind of manders and, and changes and, and goes different ways, but it still ends up in, in capitalism. Well, one of the things I think is interesting that you pointed out as a support of the urban population and what we might call like an urban quasi middle class um, is that uh, even the PRC's own stats show that despite this kind of narrative about the Dungas period from the 70s up into the 90s being this period of hyperabundance, and I, I am not saying there was no improvements, but uh, uh, the stats from the PRC itself actually indicate that like life expectancy stalled out from like about 79 to about the middle to the late nineties. Like it, um, so, and that's not something you would expect to see in a, in, in a society where everybody is, is doing better. That's something that you might see as an aggregate wash between some people doing way worse and some people doing significantly better. Um, what what happened to the countryside because you know the, we could talk about like urban poverty and then and this but the again even i've even talked to the fairly pro chinese historians who who say that at, even in china the 
the story is told in the 80s and 90s is only an urban one and they don't talk about what happened to the countryside and and how it was largely it was really only brought into the improvements like in the last 15 years yeah you mentioned a few things um that, you know first of all i think that, that one thing that we have to remember is that you know when the the countryside was kind of reformed right restructured which was the first step in the reforms right in the late 70s early 80s mm -hmm. and there you know there was also a push from let's say from the peasant side right it wasn't like just from above so the peasants were interested in in the change and the you know the the relationship between the party and the peasants or many peasants had been you know not not completely destroyed but a lot like definitely harmed um mm -hmm. since the great leap forward and the sort of catastrophe and famine that uh, in the early 60s, right? So, so pe the peasantry, you know, many people living, like farmers or farm workers in the in the communes were, were actually eager to, to change um, things. But, you know, the, 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 the changes in like the life, life expectancy and other, other things in, before, like in the, in the 60s and 70s, there was, the communes were just not, not just for production, right? They were also sort of, you know, like sort of the, administrative um, entity, including, you know, like providing health care, et cetera. So when the communes were destroyed and the land was sort of given to peasant households, um, a lot of the structures in the countryside providing, for instance, health care or education, et cetera, you know, dissolved or disappeared or definitely, you know, we're, we're not providing the same quality health care than before. So, that, so that, you know, on one hand, so you see an economic improvement in peasant incomes in the in the early 80s, mid 80s, um, so they benefit definitely. They benefit, and you can see that also, you know, in the terms of production and you know even the consumption of, of food increased, you know, in in in, in on the countryside and in, in urban areas. But at the same time, you have this like sort of problem that they, you know sort of the infrastructure, the socialist infrastructure that existed before in terms of health, healthcare, education, etc., sort of dissolved and and. Um, and that explains, partly explains, you know, the situation where, where you know, you have this, 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 this changes in in terms of life life expectancy and, and coverage of, of healthcare. Um, of course, the healthcare was, um, you know, sort of reorganized in a capitalist way, right? Later, and also in the urban areas. So, so that's a big issue. Same with education. Um, so. It's, it's interesting you mentioned that, you know, because people, some people think that, of course, there was this boom and, you know, everything got better and better for everyone, but didn't, of course, there were aspects of life that definitely did not improve. And, and healthcare is, is definitely one example. The, the situation of peasants in the late 80s, early 90s changed again. And, and um, um, you see an upsurge in peasant, I write about that in the book, right? An mm -hmm. upsurge in peasant struggles. In the, in the 90s, and you know, sort of a, let's say a cycle of struggles that that started in the early 90s and then sort of finished in the in the mid 2000s, let's say, um, of, of peasant struggles. A lot about you know like fees and taxes because you know the the government imposed a lot of, of uh, economic pressure on, on peasants um, and uh, a lot about corruption. You know, theft. Later, it's, it's land theft, uh, sort of people and peasants driven off of the land. So a lot of struggles happened there, and the situation um, of like pe like people engaged in farming actually um, was very very problematic. But at the same time, and this is important, I think, um, in the early '90s, you see a lot a huge upsurge in rural urban migration. Um, and here we are, like basically talking about the you know the sort of the the biggest proletarian group um, or, or section of the working class in in China since, let's say, the, the mid or late 90s until today, like the, the, the rural migrants who um, are still considered rural in, in a certain way, even though it's already the second or third generation living in the cities. Um, and, um, and of course, you could say on one hand, they benefited because they could escape um, you know, the countryside where the living situation, the living standard was much lower. And there were also other aspects like with for women, young women, for instance, they could go to the cities and escape like the patriarchal village set up, etc. But they found themselves 
of course, in the urban areas and industrial zones in a new situation of exploitation, sexist division of labor, you know, like really harsh working conditions, um, difficult situation in, in the dormitories, living conditions. And, you know, that's, that, you know, we've mentioned the middle class, right? so the larger, much larger uh, urban um, group is, is, of course, these um, this, this um, peasant workers, as they were called long, for long, the new working class of formerly rural people who moved to the cities. And they, you know, they, on their back, this boom, you know, that was created in, in terms of economic development and, you know, and manufacturing and construction in services, et cetera, was, you know, was, was done on, on the backs of these people. So um, I guess one question that I've always had is uh, why didn't you have a, um, was the hukou system used in this time period to, to mainly stop the development of a large urban underclass? Uh, was it used to, to, to suppress more labor? How, how was, how did the hukou system really play into, into these developments? Because I, I have often thought about, like, you know, I remember learning a decade ago during the, the during the height of Foxconn that, you know, almost, that there was a ton of, quote, illegal uh, Im immigrant workers, but they were all Chinese at Foxconn. And that's when I started learning about the hukou system, its history, its but I, I have never quite got a handle on the precise relationship of, like, how this great migration from the countryside in the cities was happening under those conditions. Yeah, just you know, just to, to refer back to what I said earlier, Luko is of course part of, or you know, translated as a household registration system. Mm. That, that that system um, is also a legacy, right, from from the socialist times because it was implemented in in the late fifties, and 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 really sort of you know pushed through and used in the, from the 60s on and, and divided the population into a rural part, much larger, 80% of the time, and an urban part of the population, 20, only like up to 20%, sometimes even less. Um, and that prevented people from, from moving to, to the cities. Um, that, you know, that, and the, the Hugo in that sense was, again, adapted, right? So um, in the early 80s already, and then Increasingly, in the early 90s, it was open so that rural migrants could temporarily move from the villages to the cities and could stay there as long as they had a job. So it's very, you know, it's comparable to like systems of, of migrant labor in, in other parts of the world where like mostly foreigners, right, foreign migrants um, are uh, led into a country for a period of time, as long as they have a job, whatever. And if they lose that job or they're not needed, there's high employment, they, whatever, are sent back. And that was the, that was how it was used um, in, in, in China from the, let's say, from the 90s on. Um, so, and, I, you know, you asked about why, you know, they, they basically kept them in this situation. Uh, I think one reason is that it's not just, you know, to, to be able to send them back. But it's it's and, and you know, most migration regimes are used to that. So it's, I think it's it was used to put them in a certain specific situation where they they are more easily exploited and put under pressure and you know sort of to accept like whatever certain certain um, you know very poor working conditions. Let's say uh, you know the, let's say the other you know whatever the better idea and from our point of view, of course, would have been to just allow them to move to the city. And then be equal to other workers, right? But then they would have asked for the same wages, for the same benefits, etc. But and 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 you know because they were would have been sure they could stay in the cities. But no, they were in a really an unstable, precarious situation, and could have could have been sent um, back uh, whenever they made trouble. And that happened actually in the in the nineties until the early two thousand. They were actually extradited, like you know, by force. Um, later, that didn't happen as much anymore, but, but um, still they were kept in, in this situation of, of sort of, you know, temporary status, of having a temporary status um, because, you know, they, they could have, you know, given um, um, 
lower wages and were kept, still kept in, a, in an unsecure situation. And there's another thing that um, concerning the social reproduction, right? So um, because of the lower living standards um, in the countryside, um, you know, a lot like old people, et cetera, who kept doing farming, were also um, asked to basically do the, you know, child care or taking care of, of, of old people um, and uh, of other old people. And so in, in a sense, like the social reduction of the working class like uh, was also done, you know, for lower prices, let's say, you know, lower costs. That meant that the capital could also reduce uh, the, or keep the wages in the cities low because they knew that, you know, that in, in, uh, the people could use that wage still to fund uh, social reproduction in the countryside. Um, so th there, there are several reasons for this. Hmm. So one thing that occurs to me that, that that occurred to me while reading your book, but I actually didn't think to warn you that I was going to ask you, and I apologize about that, um, is that I noticed an uptick in militant labor action in China, probably starting to kick up around 2008 in the urban areas. Uh, and this really becomes a big deal. And people might people might not remember the Boshi Lai scandals and all that. But this is tied into that. Um, and it, it really seems to continue. But one thing that occurred to me while I was thinking about your book, are these the same people that were doing the peasants actions, you know, before is there a relationship there? Um, like, are these, are the people le leading these kind of workers movements coming out of that? Are they separate? Like what's the relationship to those, to, uh, to those different actions, you know, this, these, these, kind of peasant militancy in the late 90s, early aughts, and then this late aughts through the aught teens labor militancy that we still kind of saw up to COVID. Well, you know, they're, they're basically two main groups, right? Still, I mean, until today in, in let's say, proletarian or working class groups in, in China, one is the sort of um, permanent working class, you know, working maybe for state, um, state-owned companies, um, and the other one is the sort of the more like subsidiary working class, um, and more precarious, which is uh, the rural migrants. You know, so you have to let's say, you know, it's a little simplifying again. You know, the urban, permanent working class, and you have the rural, temporary working class, and that's it. The the um, the biggest struggles actually after um, um, when we look back in the you know last 20, 30 years. Um, I, I think there are two big waves. One was actually in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, by those state workers, because at that point, you know, the, the, the regime starting in 95 roughly attacked the, the urban permanent old, let's say, old socialist working class and their conditions. Um, so they basically, you know, before they had lifelong employment, so they just, you know, they abolished that. Um, they have this iron rice bowl, like a set of welfare, they abolished that. Um, they gave them work contracts that could be terminated, et cetera. And a lot of them, of course, were also just kicked out and became unemployed, became unemployed and part of the urban poor. Um, and again, women were hit harder at the time. So that that was a big struggle, right, between 98 and 2002, it's, uh, roughly. After that, you know, they were still state-owned companies, right? And they were still, like, workers employed there with less of a more stable on a more stable conditions so so these struggles continued in a certain sense um and you still see them today once in a while um but you know starting in like 2003 four um definitely like the, the sort of the main the main struggle was between the new working class the rural migrants and whatever state and private capital um I'm not exactly sure what you refer to in 2008. I, th I think there was a steady increase in struggles between uh, rural migrant workers and, you know, capital. Um, let's say from 2003, um, you know, until let's say maybe 2015, roughly. And there was a peak, you know, in the in, in sort of the most prominent wave of struggles in 2010. That's important for, for two reasons. One, uh, China and the Chinese working class was very much hit 
by the financial crisis in 2007, eight as well. So basically, you know, export manufacturing collapsed and employment collapsed. Um, if I remember right, it was like 30 to 40 million migrant workers basically losing a job. Very shortly though, you know, so because it, the government brought in a huge stimulus program and, and then, you know, sort of world economy, you know, sort of kicked off again. And, and so the, most of them, these workers found employment again pretty soon, but the government had kind of stopped increasing the minimum wage, um, which before, you know, steadily increased. So for those years, they didn't. And then 2010, basically, you know, there was economy was booming. And so workers felt that, you know, we need a big increase. And there was this huge wave of struggle starting in a, in a factory of Honda, like a car factory. And then, you know, that kicked off for a few weeks and, and uh, also, you know, spread into other in sectors and industries. That was the most prominent sort of um, wave of struggles. They continued, um, you know, the, and sort of, I think that, you know, sort of when they sort of, um, the number decreased slightly that, that happened in the mid 2010s. And there, there's a big discussion why that happened. It could also be because of reporting, because the government in intensified censorship. So it's not really clear, you know, we don't, we don't really, is this the numbers that we hear about or is it the actual numbers that have decreased? And then of course the pandemic changed things again um, in a certain way uh, and made it more difficult. But struggles do continue. I mean, still, I just checked it today um, in the morning that, you know, when you look at there's a, a strike map on China Labor Bulletin where you can read about, um, you know, the case of struggles they hear about and they don't just don't use media, they also use other sources and uh, you can see that these struggles continue. Boshi Lai, you know, you mentioned that. And I think this is, this is it's interesting because, um, of course, you know, from a left-wing perspective, a certain part of the left, let's say, you know, really put hope into, into Boshi Lai. So who was Boshi Lai? He was actually a very high sort of, you know, in the, in the hierarchy of the CCP, very high politician, um, you know, in the government, in the Chinese central government for a while, and then he was leader, or leader in, uh, in Chongqing, like a very big industrial zone in Western China. And he introduced a cer certain measures like in public housing or, um, you know, welfare measures, etc. And also he used sort of Maoist folklore, like sort of Maoist you know, images, et cetera, songs, et cetera. He also started a, a anti-corruption campaign. So, so le certain left-wing people made him into this, you know, new hope for the left. Um, I don't think he's even left-wing. Um, I think he mixed like a neoliberal strategy for developing Chongqing with, you know, sort of welfare measures. And I don't consider welfare necessarily as progressive, right? Welfare, is a, is a form to undermine social tensions, um, to make some concessions. Um, you know, one of the forms of containment that that you already mentioned that I talk about in the book. So Boshi Lai used that, um, and um, and part of the sort of you know more loyalist, let's say, or the Maoist right. You know, there's another description um, supported him. Um, interesting, and then of course he was you know because he was a competitor arrival of Xi Jinping or seen as, as one. He he was, himself was uh, accused of, of, of corruption and then imprisoned in 2012. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that um, actually Xi Jinping and his faction, they have learned from Bo Xilai and they have started to use references to you know Marxism or socialism um, you know, sort of left-wing images, Maoist images as well. Um, and they successfully also got the support of a part of the Maoist, uh, Maoist or the Maoist right in, in China. So uh, in a sense, I know that outside China, Oshi Lai and that story was also kind of seen as, you know, sort of hopeful left-wing perspective, but I don't agree to that. 
It's um, I, I've always been somewhat ambivalent about it myself. I studied it when I was actually living in Asia and was very confused by it. Honestly, um, you know, uh, I will admit that the PRC politics at, um, during the transition from Hu Jintao to Xi Jinping was very hard for me to understand. <laughs> um, uh, part of it is the Western coverage of it wasn't very good. Um, and, and I think, you know, I think when we talk about 2008, I think that's when we started hearing about it in the West. I don't think that's when it happened. Um, I, um, so one of the things that I think has unfortunately come out of this is, uh, and maybe this can start to, to lead us to the, to this whole red new deal period and the seeming very strange cultural messaging that's coming out of China right now, uh, which is in some ways uh, been beginning of this Red New Deal seem very anti um, uh, queer um, and yet recently has taken kind of a different approach, but um, or at least it's being reported on in the West by sympathetic people as being taken a different approach. Um, I don't want to get totally lost in the cultural war elements of that, though. Um, one thing I guess I, I want to to focus in on before we get to that is there was a a kind of external push uh, beginning in the Hu Jintao period, I think around 2006, with the establishment of the Confucius Institutes. Um, and stuff like that to really push Chinese culture, and the Chinese culture they were pushing was not was not branded as communist at the time. So, like you know, the Confucian interests were not playing up any communist allegiance. It, it, it does seem like the 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 like recuperation of a kind of neo Maoism has also been pushed out to the world. Is it even like elements of uh, of of leftist parties outside of China. When did that begin in, in your estimation? And is that part of, is that for diplomatic reasons or is it for internal reasons? That doesn't seem clear to me. Okay, well, these are the two things, right? I think one, on one hand, the, you know, there's sort of the usage of Confucianism, um, you know, that basically also started with the, with the concept of the harmonious society, sort of the fusion of you know, ideas from like whatever that usually used to be the, the enemy of the CCP and the so the critique of the feudalism of feudalism and Confucianism was kind of like forgotten and just neglected or whatever ignored, and so they used it suddenly used it for and merged it kind of you know with the, with 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 other concepts, um, they like nationalism for instance, a pride you know on you know uh, when it comes to like long history of, of Chinese. Imperialism, or imperial China, let's say, um, and uh, I think they did that in the mid two thousands because, as he has a reaction to this large scale struggles that are referred to by state worker, state uh, workers in state owned factories and, and enterprises, and uh, and the upcoming struggles of migrants, so they needed a new kind of, you know, social socially sort of um, uh, embedded um, discourse, state discourse um, to, to explain what they were doing and, and basically also sort of uh, undermine other sort of left-wing or whatever more confrontational ideas of, of struggle, of social struggle um, at, the, at the time. So the Confucian Institute is obviously, you know, this is like towards, you know, the outer world. <laughs> Other other countries, but but I think it, it's combined with kind of this is a domestic attempt um, and to to undermine social tensions and basically also threaten anyone who is was engaging in in, 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 in confrontations. Um, that you know, I think that um, that uh, the government of the regime actually sort of also um, keeps up links to sort of left wing. You know, certain sort of, you know, more orthodox left-wing currents in other countries. I don't think that ever completely stopped. Um, 
and um, um, you know, definitely it still happened in the eighties. Um, but uh, you know, as you pointed out, like the, you know, the sort of um, the main discourse, you know, sort of um, intellectual discourses as well um, changed in in uh, in the in, in, again in the late two thousands and early two thousand tens because of all. You know, since the, let's say the '80s, there was a definitely a big impact of sort of more liberal ideas, especially in the intellectual scenes, uh, and then you know, sort of certain parts of the intellectuals in the '90s already answered to that. You know, um, often referred to as the new left, um, although although they you know themselves didn't didn't use that term much, or they just said description, not as a said description, but there was a sort of already a sort of a, a debating like turning against these liberal liberal ideas but definitely liberalism um or you know especially like in economic liberalism obviously um influenced or had a lot of influence even in the party um in in uh, in the 90s and into the 2000s right um and i would say it still does but it's more hidden now behind um you know sort of more you know this this I, for me, it's like just like talk, right, about um, so, uh, market socialism or you know socialism with with Chinese characteristics and all of that. Right? This is just um, some speak, you know, some some sort of illusion that's given, um, and that has a sense, right? That has a sense of hiding the the real nature, the exploitative nature of, of the system. But um, so it, it's not like you know it's deliberately used, obviously. Um, why, I mean, how and why groups from other countries respond to that, um, you know, sort of present China as sort of, you know, anti-imperialist uh, um, force against your US imperialism or still present it as socialist or whatever you have to ask them. I think, you know, that, that um, Different reasons might play a role, um, including financial reasons, um, including uh, reasons of you know sort of basically bribes or whatever, um, but also um, you know academic careers, etc. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why it might be not beneficial to criticize um, the Chinese regime from a left-wing perspectives, their perspective, but rather sort of. Um, spread their, you know, their propaganda. Um, but that's something I can't really answer. I think that's a fair point. Um, it does seem like there is a major, like historical Maoist organizations, for example, uh, uh, tended to take a hostile line towards actually existing China after the 1980s. And that seems to have largely gone away at least in america in the last five years and i know you're not american so i was asking you about that's kind of unfair but it, it it does seem like this this has been pretty thorough um I, some of that i think may be playing into just frustrations about left-wing development here and and the clear like the clear, absurdly anti-Chinese bias that sometimes come out of the media here, it, it, you know, um, even if, it, like me, I've been insisting that China was capitalist for a long time, but even I'm sometimes just taken aback by some of what is claimed. Um, that said, uh, I guess we, we do have to deal with um, a couple of issues, and one that I've become increasingly more honed in and is the nature of of Chinese nationalism and Chinese nationalism going back to Sun Yat-sen has has been a civic multi-ethnic nationalism not like a nationalism in the in the conventional old Marxist Leninist national question sense um but it does seem like there's been a pretty big resurgence in, since the beginning of the capitalist reforms in Han specific nationalism. Uh, is that true? Is that just something that's being presented to the West? What What is going on there? Well, first of all, I, I, I think that, you know, that when we look at the socialist period, you know, sort of roughly from the fifties to, to the late seventies, it's not that this nationalism or racism 
colonialism didn't exist, right? Um, and um, and of course, they, you know, there were other aspects as well. You know, so they, they kept talking about international solidarity and supported, you know, certain guerrilla movements and in, in the in the global south, uh, anti-colonial movements, etc. Like, um, but but at the same time, you know, they they colonial uh, colonialized, um, you know, the the West. You know, what was what's known as Xinjiang. They, um, you know, they, they were sort of. It, it wasn't like sort of that. They, um, that nationalism had disappeared, and I think um, one reason for that is obviously that the whole sort of narrative, the party narrative of, you know, the, the justification of its existence and its importance in its Chinese history is the liberation from Japanese imperialism and occupation. Um, and so from the very start, you know, there was this element of national liberation. Um, and obviously that changed after uh, the reform started and especially, it, it, I think it did change when, you know, in the last, let's say, 10, 15 years, when um, the Chinese ruling class realized that it had successfully actually become a major power, you know, in the world, right? So, so basically the strategy that even Deng Xiaoping um, still sort of promoted um, in the 80s, you know, sort of to be very careful when, when addressing uh, sort of geostrategical issues, or like sort of you know when 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 communicating you know or or, or, or trading or whatever with with other powers in the world, um, you know this, this 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 caution has disappeared, you know, because the Chinese Communist Party leadership has realized, hey, we are a big player now, and we can do this, right? Like so so the the sort of what, the, even the recent um, show of force uh, when you know when it comes to Taiwan, you know the, the war games, etc. I think that's something that in that way wouldn't have happened in the same you know the same uh, shape um, 30 years ago, and even the the other Taiwan crisis that that we've seen in the 90s, they didn't go as far. You know now it's 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 clear that the Chinese regime knows that it can it can expand, it can put pressure on other countries, etc. Um, the, you mentioned Han uh, nationalism. I think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm careful, right? Because I think that there's no consistent sort of ideology of Han superiority in the CCP, but there are elements of that. You know, so, so you know, there are elements of, of racist ideas, of, you know, and, and also the sort of what, what the party, what the censorship uh, allows to be expressed online in terms of, you know, we are superior, um, you know, now it's our time <laughs> to, to, to whatever, you know, play a big role in the world. I mean, there are these elements uh, um, and definitely they play a role in the, in the policies in Xinjiang, for instance, um, and, and against other, you know, in other areas like, like Tibet or uh, in Mongolia, Versus uh, groups that are not considered Han, um, that definitely they definitely play a role. But I don't think it's a consistent like sort of um, element of of like of like Communist Party propaganda yet. Mm. Yeah, it, it seems to me like it's somewhat o overstated, but it does seem like a social force that isn't being tapped down on. I think that that feels fair. Um, I guess one thing I think it's hard to for people to understand, and it's hard for me to understand because I know, for example, Chinese politics is highly regional as far as like the way the the, the CCP works and who gets promoted into the Politburo is 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 more regional than it is ideological. But there does seem to be rough factions um, within, say, the current G Politburo. Um, and they're very hard for Westerners to understand, I think. Um, so um, we've talked about like a, a, a CCP right and a CCP left. Um, and I think that might be even different than a Chinese left. But what does that mean right now when we talk about that? Okay, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm currently finishing another, another book, <laughs> okay. um, which, which where the title is The Left in China. 
and I'm actually writing, but I'm writing about the, you know what I call the other left or the oppositional left, right? So I'm mm-hmm. not really so much interested or you know like like focusing, let's say, on on the you know factions within the CCP at different times, um, because I'm more interested in like sort of the relation between social struggles mm-hmm. and sort of oppositional left wing movements within the socialist period, the transitional period, and the capitalist period. So a little, little different. What I earlier mentioned was like sort of Maoist left, Maoist right. Um, that definitely that basically refers to both, right? So there's the Maoist left. What's called the Maoist left is definitely outside the party, right? So um, these are sort of groups that um, sort of somehow you know took up Maoist arguments. A lot of them are young people. Um, Young people means you know the sort of they 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 were maybe students ten years ago and that's when when I when I kind of come across came across them and they were like sort of involved in like discussion groups and a lot of uh, students but also other other people and they developed sort of a critique of contemporary Chinese capitalism um, and kind of a, re- a revolutionary perspective um, where the migrant workers play a central role. But also they kept, you know, they've sort of held on to um, ideas of party, of sort of Marxist-Leninist ideology of hierarchy um, and education of the masses and mobilization. I mean, all you know, all these old terms. And um, but they, you know, that, some of them, let's say, um, are in the nationalist, you know. Um, refer to our movements in other countries and you know there are also contexts. Of course at the moment it's very difficult because there harsh repression against them since for the last few years, you know, after um, kind of prominent struggle in South China in 2018 around a factory called Jessic. Um, so you know there's this is but are there more are there more groups, not just those involved in the Jessic case, but but this is the mouse left. Um, there's a, the what I call the Mao's rights. They, these are people inside the party and outside the party who basically support a nationalist. I mean, they, they have a critique of capitalism. You know, they might even have a critique of contemporary capitalism in China uh, to a certain extent, um, and they want to improve the you know sort of the lives of, of, of proletarians. They're anti-neoliberal often, and they're part of the new left, as you know, is, is in this category as well. But on the other hand, they are. They're nationalists. They support, um, you know, sort of China's role in the in the world, and in, in, you know, so even the economic expansion uh, in, to a certain extent. And some of them also support Xi Jinping and his regime, because they still hope, you know, that that there's a, there's a core socialist core, um, and the party can be re sort of re won, you know, taken over again by sort of leftist parts of the party. This this is a Maoist right. I don't think, you know, you refer to the Politburo. I, I think that, you know, it's very difficult, as you said, to um, to uh, talk about any faction at the moment. And um, and I think that, you know, if we talk about factions, rather you have a more pragmatic um, neoliberal <laughs> faction or capitalist faction in the leadership um, that um, wants to continue with some economic reforms, uh, you know, knows wants to kind of um, um, keep up that China model, which involves obviously cooperation with Western capital, which is you know high has highly invested in in China, right? I mean, just to emphasize that because sometimes that's lost in in the debate. Rather, right? you know, the ca- foreign capital plays a major role inside China, um, and uh, you know, Tesla is just the last example, but you know, a lot of other investors are active there so it's it's not you don't have like separated blocks like you had you know in the cold war era you know where basically there were connections between the soviet bloc and the western bloc but, but you know there were few and today they are really interconnected systems still um so that's the pragmatic let's say more pragmatic part and then you have one that's more let's say ideologic ideological in some sense um, and you know, he sort of underlines the, you know, the sort of, you know, China can go its own way. Um, you know, we have to fight for our own interests. We have to confront foreign powers. Um, 
And in order to do that, you know, we need a strong state. We have to be careful with the reforms. I think they were those two facts, and this is like Xi Jinping actually. So you, you have those two, but but how far are they really apart? You know, and I think that the sort of if you talk about an opposition in the party, it's not a left wing opposition. It's more like a liberal um, mm. opposition that um, you know that in inside the party. That plays a role. And this might be different on the ground. You know? This might be different in certain areas. Uh, you mentioned that China is huge. Um, the party is huge as well. Tens of millions of members. So they, they, you know, I'm not saying there are no, you know, sort of people who um, who still believe in some left wing agenda inside the party. But I don't think they play a big role in in the central or even the provincial um, regimes. Mm. So. A, a lot of uh, noise was made in, in the West in both uh, socialist and non-socialist circles about the Red New Deal, particularly coming out of the initial COVID crisis. Um, uh, I, I think I wanted to ask you, um, do you see, how do you see containment of these social movements that have still been kind of bubbling up playing into this Red New Deal? Yeah. Now, that's a good question. I mean, you know, first, let me say, you know, I'm, I'm not using the term um, a Red New Deal because I think it, you know, and both parts of the term are basically misleading. I think the, the measures taken are far less consistent and important um, than, you know, the, the New Deal measures in, in the 30s in the US, you know, which basically created or started a new period, you know, a kind of new form of regulation. In, in, in the US capitalism, but also in global capitalism. So I think, you know, we're not talking about the same sort of importance here. And RED, um, of course, um, kind of, you know, seems to imply it's like left wing or socialist stuff, which I don't, I don't think it is. I think you know, what we see is measures that are quasi Keynesian, like state interventionist, uh, in a certain extent, we see like some sort of welfare measures or promised welfare measures uh, as part of this common prosperity, which you know term that that was 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 used again in you know, a common prosperity discussion, uh, which is kind of you know sort of ironic because the term was actually <laughs> a long time ago in the fifties was used um, to basically um, argue against any sort of you know, sort of uh, capitalist um, structures against sort of, you know, um, a few getting rich and, you know, la later the others can follow these kind of ideas, you know. And then, then Xiaoping changed it in the 70s, 80s and, and used it for saying, no, it doesn't mean egalitarianism, you know, it's some can rich, get rich further, uh, first and the others later. And so common prosperity is, is you know, part of this reform argument. And when, when the term was used and, you know, there was this hype, you mentioned that, right? There, well, there was a hype on the, on, in some parts of the left saying, hey, you know, you see there, you know, they, there's some left-wing elements. And uh, on the right or the liberal side, you, I mean, a liberal in the, in the sort of capitalist sense, um, you saw people, you know, predicting, you know, yeah, you see, you know, the, Xi Jinping is still communist and stuff like this. But I think this is all like those misleading that they, you know, the, the, the state obviously, you know, is uh, still, um, and, this, and the Communist Party leadership is still afraid of, of uh, social conflicts and, and tensions. And um, the, the lockdown measures in early 2020 uh, were pretty harsh on parts of the, again, migrant worker class. Um, and also, you know, they, they, you can you can see that the, while the situation of a lot of proletarians improved, let's say between the mid 2000s uh, and the mid 2010s, since then they have not improved much anymore. So uh, you know, there is an anger and dissatisfaction, um, and um, and the party knows about that. So that this talk about common prosperity. And also, you know, linked to that, the sort of campaign against, you know, private capitalists involved in the IT industry, for instance, um, that's also part of, you know, of, of the discussion here. 
um, that were used um, uh, in as you know as arguments or as, as sort of measures um, in containing certain um, you know certain de debates, but also you know certain developments um, that, for instance, you know the show, the public showing of wealth. Uh, let's say, you know, there's another thing that, that the party kind of tries to contain because, of course, that creates a lot of anger. You know, if you see party officials with like, you know, expensive watches and, you know, having big, big, big celebrations, big cars, etc. And also the private capitalists, um, you know, showing off their wealth. That's something the party doesn't wants to restrict. Um, and it was also wants to restrict like sort of um, the, uh, economic developments that, that are out of its reach. So that's part of that containment um, um, that, that I describe in the book. And you could, you could see, or you could use that, you know, for all the three measures. I, I talk about three measures of containment, right? Repression, co-optation, and concessions. And in a certain sense, you can see all three elements here because of course, common prosperity, the argument is like sort of, you know, we do something for the poor. We are interested in like, you know, uh, more, like better uh, like uh, situation for for the working class. This is kind of co-opting, you know, sort of left-wing arguments in, in that sense. Meanwhile, in, at the same time, left-wing groups are repressed, right? Like like uh, feminist groups, labor groups are harshly repressed um, in China. Um, and um, the, you know, with women, you see it. Or with feminists, you see it very clearly. On one hand, there are some legal improvements, like you know, sort of, uh, you know, laws against sexual harassment implemented in sort of the laws, like the uh, civil code, etc. On the other hand, like feminist groups that have demanded those, you know, those in, in improve, legal improvements have been repressed. And this is like sort of one of these, you know, sort of um, containment, uh, containment methods. And the last part, the concession part, um, I think we have to see, but again, because I, for me, it's not clear that whether you know, the, what you call the Red New Deal, like these measures actually improve the situation of proletarians. You know, maybe they do, and then we can talk, we can say there are concessions, right, in, in that sense. But I, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I don't, I'm not clear about that yet. And, and uh, when we look at the last few months, I think we, we might come to that anyway. Like what's new, what, what happened in the last, last uh, few years, right. we see that actually the situation of of uh, proletarians has actually um, seen more problems um, in terms of income and employment, for instance. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that's often been missed uh, in, by a lot of people who celebrate this Chinese boom period of the last 20 years um, is that GDP has been gradually and slowly growing down. Uh, liberals in the West predicted that it would that would lead to a total collapse of China seemingly overnight, and that has obviously not happened, um, and I, I don't think is really on the table. Um, but what I what I will say is, we have seen worker militancy in China increase dramatically during this time period, as you know. GDP and other measures of profitability decline. Um, and that that seems to be pretty reasonable to me. <laughs> like it doesn't that, that that isn't surprising, right? Um, the what I find interesting about that is I think what we get lost in to go maybe back to something that you mentioned in the beginning is we do have this development of a seemingly prosperous, highly skilled tech sector in the urban cores of China. Um, like that seems, that seems real. It, it, it seems to be state policy. We've seen an increase in those wages, but a lot of that has been complicated during COVID. So I wanted to ask you, you know, um, from the, the initial Wuhan COVID period to this zero COVID period, has there been containment and what has been going on with workers actions and militancy during this period because it does seem like and again i'm i like i don't read mandarin so uh, even though i have a lot of chinese friends who do um uh i i i cannot verify this one way or the other but it does seem like there has been a lot more 
um, uh, th there's been more worker stuff than we know going on during this time period uh, during COVID and things have not always gone well. And there have been failures that have been largely blamed on provincial leadership. Um, whether or not that's fair is another question. Yeah, let, let, let me just like before I answer the question, I think that one thing that's important is that, you know, China's economy has not actually shrunk, right? Like the, right. The, what happened is that in the last, you know, roughly roughly 10 years um, is that the, the growth rate has um, has been smaller, you know, than, than, than before, lower than before. So China's economy is still growing but not as fast as before. That That's what changed. But, and of course, that's a big deal because until recently, you know, every year, you know, millions of people entered the labor market. You know, there was still like migration from the countryside to the city. So basically, the, and there are high expectations, right, for improvement. So the Chinese regime uh, depended on basically large growth rates to create employment, you know, and, 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 and to somehow fulfill some of the expectations, you know, and, and its promises and, um, and meet, meet the expectations and fulfill promises. But so in that sense, you know, the, the stability of the regime depended on large growth rates. As you said, you know, um, people predicted that when that stops, the regime would collapse. I remember this actually happened a few times, like, um, in the in the late 80s, there was talk about collapse. In the 90s, late 90s, you know, so it's not new that you know sort of people predict this system will collapse, you know, in, in China. So because the contradictions were obvious, but it hasn't, and I think it's it's both, right? It's stable and unstable. You know, it's not as um, unstable as some people think, but it's also <laughs> there are aspects where it's not stable, and and that also gives us hope that at some point there will be. You know, a way for struggles to actually change the uh, the situation and change the system. Um, yeah. Now, on, uh, you know, referring to a question like the, the, I think it's important. Like even when we talk about, you know, the IT proletariat, right? The, the, the sort of the workers in the IT industry, um, their situation has gotten a lot worse in the in recent years, um, especially this year. Um, and but but even before that, they were you know there were there are even struggles, right? So, so one thing is that that you know wages were high, but working conditions were terrible. They created a kind of movement um, uh, as well uh, a few years ago, and uh, of, of workers complaining about the working uh, long working times. But recently, you know, the work pressure has increased. It's very hard for IT people to find new jobs. I recently read an article, you know, like people complaining how they had to accept um, uh, new jobs with much lower wages um, than, than before. I'm not saying, you know, they still earn a lot more than a factory worker would get or domestic helper, um, but, but uh, you know, the times are not as rosy as, as they were before. Um, when we look at struggles, uh, I think one aspect of the, look, of the pandemic in China is of course that, you know, even though the first the first wave in 2020, right, in, in the spring, that was pretty much contained fast, right, and so so the effects were pretty short term, um, and uh, and people can you know could could get employment again. It, it did affect um, migrant workers, especially those in in Hubei, like like Wuhan, uh, where, where, you know Wuhan, the, the center where they were all started uh, was locked down for, for, for a while and, and people couldn't get out, etc. But it didn't affect large parts of the um, proletariat that much at the time, but it did uh, this year when we had a spike in cases in March and April and then massive lockdowns, much bigger ones than three years ago, that affected a lot of people's lives. And I mean, the most prominent case, of course, Shanghai, that was in the media. A lot of people complained about that. But what is kind of hidden is that, you know, people actually lost, you know, their income for months. Um, it's not just they were hard for some people to get food, but, you know, many people lost their income for months. And we're just living on 
um, you know, whatever save money or or uh, support from others. And I think this is something that that plays out now in the struggles as well as seen recently are about, you know, not unpaid wages, basically, um, and compensation and stuff, you know, when, when, when companies go, go, go bankrupt. I think that these are all defensive, right? So it's not, you know, 10 years ago, so workers would struggle for better wages, for improvements, um, you know, they had demands, they had high expectations, and now it's more, more, you know, things shouldn't go get worse, or we should get what you know we're entitled to, like wages didn't get, or compensations. You know, so I think we are in a phase where actually the working class not really on an offensive, but more in a defend, defensive situation, um, trying to prevent a situation where things get even worse. Yeah, I I recently read a translation of uh, of a speech from uh, uh, G, and so so. You know, I use the Red New Deal talk because that's how it's commonly referred to here. But he was also complaining um, explicitly about uh, encouraging laziness through welfareism recently. So it seems like they're taking a much more austere turn than even what they were doing a year ago. Is that does that feel accurate from your perspective? Yeah, I think it's a very good. You know, you mentioned that because um, uh, you know this is interesting because now we w would have to talk about you know the sort of the the discourse and the reality, and it's really hard to, to grab them, right? So for a few years now, you have a situation where similar to Europe, North America, Japan at some point, you know, that, that you know, with the growth of, like, sort of you know, with the, with the improvement of living conditions, especially in the urban areas, um, and after like a period of like people like really working very hard, very long hours, et cetera, to, to make that, you know, sort of improve their situation, now you have a situation where a lot of, especially young people, um, you know, they feel that on one hand, you know, situ situation has changed. So even if they work hard, they don't really get a better situation, you know? So a lot of people are stuck in a system where, I just talked about the IT workers, right? Where you can learn, you can go to university, you learn like how to program or whatever, do project management, but then you never end up in a job that actually gives you a reward for this. Um, and on the other hand, you also have a lot of people who question, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the ethical work as such. And again, you know, you have these sort of movements in, in other countries at different stages um, back, back, back in the year. So uh, you have, have had a discourse in, in the Chinese media and Chinese social media among young people about both, right, about, you know, what is really important in life, you know, and then people would say, you know, hey, I, don't, I, I drop out, you know, I, I don't care anymore. Uh, or people would say, you know, let's not work hard anymore. Let's just like, there was this lying flat debate, for instance. And I think that, you know, so this is a discourse. And I think, you know, behind that is a certain behavior, obviously, that people actually drop out or don't consider work that central anymore. And, I, you know, and the party has now because of the discourse spread so much had to react and even she's being reacted to this which which is interesting you know and because what they see is obviously that you know they might lose a part of the youth um that is not behind this idea of hard work for the nation hard work for uh you know for china, for the china model anymore and one thing they they also address um, in you know that's in different speeches, different measures is also the refusal of women to you know have enough children and be enough children, like uh, which which is uh, again an ironic situation because since the early '80s the party has of course promoted the one-child policy and you know sort of allowing a woman, especially women, urban women only one child and since um, for you know more than more you know since let's say 10 years or so um, they know that this will lead to a situation where actually the labor shortage they already have will will get even worse and they won't have enough labor power in the future so they started this you know started the two child policy in 2016 now it's like three child even in the promote 
it's like a natalist policies that promote mm. more children, like they ask women to have more children, but what Chinese women refuse. So there's another refusal, basically, apart from the ethic of work, you know, also the ethic of, you know, and, you know, having children from the nation or whatever, fulfilling your, your duties um, also meets resistance. And I think this is very interesting because these are two, two sides of, of uh, what I call like kind of more like social, social resistance from below against, um, against the, the regime and its economic model. And the, the party obviously, you know, reacts to that and tries to push it back and, and, um, and also punish obviously people who, who promote that. Yeah, I, one of the things is, is hard to gauge is the kind of unofficial sell, uh, settlements and repression with workers, movements and events in China. Um, because, you know, everything happens outside of the All Chinese Labor Union. That seems to be kind of kind of a, a ceremonial <laughs> holdover or something. Um, but... Uh, there, there does seem to be like some concessions made, but also repression, and it's it's very opaque. It's even opaque when I talk to Chinese people about this. I, I get a feeling that they also don't really know how this is all playing out. Um, uh, and one hint that tells me that things might be getting really difficult for both both everyday people and maybe for the for the PRC itself is what happened in Henan a few weeks ago with the bank, with an unexpected bank holiday. Like, um, and Henan's a region that, if you follow Chinese news, has kind of been hard hit a lot. I mean, we think about Wuhan, but Henan's another one. Um, uh, what, what are we seeing and how are these struggles being settled? And is the government able to even make backdoor concessions right now? Yeah, this is, you know this goes back to what we discussed earlier about like authoritarianism and how it works out, right? I think the you know the the CCP has developed its its you know sort of its practices and institutions for a long time. You know, like um, let's say the, those who who play a role today, where they started to develop them in the nineties. Um, you know, like legal structures, laws. Um, arbitration, um, you know, of course, police, uh, different forms of policing, um, and and of course, and like sort of the practices behind that. And I think, and this is very planned, right? It's not, it's not like a chance. So, um, uh, Chen Quan Li and the co-author, they they wrote a paper um, a few years ago, how you know, like um, party and state officials were trained. In um, in how to deal with with social tensions and how to you know how to deal like sort of what to do you know if, if they reach certain stages if they spread you know sort of so it's not it's not by change and and I think what what might be puzzling when looking from it out from outside is that it's a combination right it's like sort of of on one hand um, tolerating what you know tolerating certain social um, expressions of discontent that includes strikes for instance there's no legal basis right for strikes uh, so they're all wildcats but on the, at the same time there's no anti-strike law either um, and so um, that gives the the regime like some some leeway right so they can some space they can react in in different ways you know so if there's a strike they can go and kind of go they see how far it goes maybe the you know the whatever the bosses and the, the workers find a solution if they don't the state might intervene if if there's a demonstration like so it spreads or even you know so crosses over to other other enterprises factories then you know they might send police so it's it's like sort of in different stages they have like so different ways how to intervene um you know, and the same with the cooptation, right? Like sort of, you know, there's, I think there, it's clear that the party doesn't allow, you know, like independent organizations. So they have a state union, you know, that's very part, much part of the whole apparatus, but they wouldn't allow other institutions, other organizations like independent 
organizations like independent unions or, or whatever groups. Um, but at the same time, they know that there is the anger and discontent and that needs a valve, right? Like needs to be expressed and dealt with. So there's a, you know, there's sort of, a, and this is like part of what any sort of activist, any pe person politically active or socially active in China learns, there's some space that you have um, to express, let's say, discontent or demands, but that has limits. And um, and even workers, you know, like who are not, like let's say, not organized in any sense, like, apart from being organized at work, obviously, um, they learn, you know, it's kind of part of a proletarian wisdom <laughs> that this is what you can do and here's the, you know, the limit. And so you can go to the, whatever, the boss and ask for more money and you can even organize a strike, but, you know, don't be in the first row um, or don't be the one who expressed that, you know, so, because then you will be kicked out. So I think this, and, you know, both like sort of activists learn how to deal with the situation and, and workers learn it as well. Of course, you know, this, you know, this might change and, and part of authoritarian rules, obviously, that you cannot count um, much on how power is used. I mean, even in non-authoritarian societies, it's often difficult, but in, definitely in China, you don't know um, and there are changes. So in 2018, obviously, there was a change when activity was, that was kind of tolerated before um, by left-wing groups, Maoist, you know, discussion groups, universities, et cetera, was suddenly not tolerated anymore. Um, and the same sort of changes you, you sometimes uh, see in, in terms of social struggles. But that might also change again, right? I'm not, you know, sort of, you know, in, we might see a situation where there will be more space again for some form of political organizing, left-wing political organizing in China as well, again. Um, because that one, the one problem, if I, if I might <laughs> at the end, I think one problem that, that the current regime has is that, you know, they increased repression, they increased control, censorship, um, to a point where they become very inflexible uh, and also, you know, the, the sort of the that the Xi Jinping faction basically sort of occupies most of the power positions now means, you know, the, within the party, there's not much room anymore for critique and discussion that's necessary to adapt right, to a new situation. So it's, I call it a petri, petrifying, you know, aspect like a petrifying um, of, of the structures. And that means that, you know, that uh, they might not be able to react as flexible and as sort of responsive as they used to in the, you know, sort of like 10 years ago, let's say, or a few years ago. And um, that, that, that's basically, you know, the situation that, that and, and, you know, there could be a big crisis starting, you know, by the effects of pandemic, starting by other like sort of economic pressures um, and the regime will not be able to deal with it not on the on the on the level of of governance, uh, but also not on the level of like how to control, um, you know, the the struggles or the tensions. I think that's an important point to end off on because it does seem like there's a lot of tensions and struggles coming, and Han, and the Hanan thing seems to be kind of a precursor of it. Um, uh, that, that doesn't mean. I would also have to say that no one's predicting that China's just going to fall tomorrow. Like that's not what anyone's saying. Cause I know how people tend to take the, take these kinds of statements. Um, uh, so you do a lot of work on uh, a website uh, uh, that I do not necessarily know how to pronounce. <laughs> I, I pronounce Gong Chao. Don't know. Gong Chao. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, and there's a lot of good stuff in English and in German and in Chinese on that site. I think there's other languages too, but that's what I see the most of. Um, I find it really helpful. Uh, uh, even I, I've been 
listening and reading to some of your stuff on the, the, the Taiwan Hong Kong situations about the left in Taiwan. Um, uh, I have been a regular visitor to Taipei uh, when I lived in uh, the Koreas, but um, and so I, I do. I actually probably understand Taiwanese politics a little better than I understand uh, mainland politics. Um, and um, uh, I think your site's been pretty insightful for 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 understanding that too, because I think Taiwan's also had a kind of weird rightward turn um, at various times, uh, and. And the alignment of the Taiwanese left can seem very, I think, very odd to to outsiders. Um, uh, uh, the, the remnants of the KMT in, in Taiwan uh, are also like sometimes they're very hostile to uh, to the CPC. Sometimes they're kind of friendly to the CCP, and that is also confusing. I think to outsiders who don't, who imagine that Taiwan is just you know, a puppet government of the U.S. or, uh, you know, or this, that, and the other. Um, uh, so I find it very helpful to read that and to get beyond headlines about, like, you know, geopolitical brinksmanship between Nancy Pelosi and and, and the PRC, because uh, the, as we were talking about off air, uh, you know, I lived in Korea during the Yampang Island incident and, very, and during the transition from... Uh, um, from Kim, um, from uh, to Kim Il Sung um, during that transition, and I remember even NPR sounding blatantly propagandistic when we were on the ground. There were changes and there were concerns, but uh, I, I swear to you, they they when they sent American news crews out there, they found like the two old people who were really, really, really paranoid, and that's who they interviewed. And they also happen to speak English. Um, and uh, not that people don't commonly speak English in, in Korea, but it, it, it was very telling because I'm like, nobody is that freaked out here. Like, um, and I, that's actually true in Taiwan too. Um, a lot of the time you get this, you get this feeling of tensions and it's not that it doesn't matter. It's not that people aren't noticing. It's not, there isn't a change in relations all that is true, but a lot of this has been normalized for so long. Daily life doesn't really stop, right? And and that's something to understand. Um, and if you want to understand, you know, the, the Taiwanese social movements and whatnot, you kind of have to a little bit ignore all that, I think. That was very much true with trying to understand, like, Korean social movements. It's just ignore what they're talking about in the English press. It's not usually all that relevant. Um and so I think your site helps with that. And I wanted to tell people to check that out. Uh, and you go into more detail about the things we've talked about today. Uh, I also listened to your um, interview uh, over at 99. Um, I have comprehension of German. Um, <laughs> I don't really speak it anymore. Um, so, uh, but I, I learned a little bit from that too. It informed our interview today a little bit. So I will put both of those links in the show notes. Um, I think people should read your book. Um, I've been reading a bunch of books about, uh, about, about China recently. And this was, uh, this one is up there with, um, with Rebecca, uh, Dr. Rebecca Carl's book and kind of helping me understand these various social movements, uh, uh, and and even put it in dialogue with someone who's much more sanguine on the government right now, like uh, Dong Ping Han, uh, because they actually say they all three of those books, even though they have very big, you know, you probably don't agree with Dr. Carl, and I know you don't agree with 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 Dr. Han. Um, there are things in all three books that actually confirm insights from all of them. So I would tell people to start cross reading, and um, I look forward to this book on. Uh, on Chinese social movements. I feel like so far in the West, we pretty much get Swang and Chow, uh, and Cal Collective, and I don't really trust one of those. And the other, I I'm, I, I don't, you know, comes from a, a very, very particular perspective. So um, I'm looking forward to more knowledge about, you know, the kind of uh, the left outside of, of the Ch Communist Party in China um, and what that looks like in Chinese social movements in general. Um, because I, I do get the feeling that that uh, that Chinese worker militancy is is still 
pretty significant. Um, but it's hard to understand. And maybe since COVID on a losing ground, uh, with the rest, honestly, even in the United States where, where you would think labor would be strong given its rarity, uh, everything seems to be kind of on a losing ground in terms of labor battles. Um, so it's, it might be good for us to understand the similarities of our situation. So I want to thank you for that. Anything else would you like, uh, uh, my listeners to look up and uh, and read. No, I mean you, you mentioned that you're going to our website. There's a link to a, a blog. I'm also doing um, um, where, where um, it's, it's nqch.org um, where where there's some more material. Um, <clears throat> and there you know there are a couple of, of also podcasts that that people also in English. That I did, or that I, I did with other with other people, interviewed other people. Um, so if people are more into listening, um, you also find that both on on Gong Chao and on on the blog. Uh, the book um, the the left in China will come out uh, late this year, or maybe early next year at Pluto Press. Okay. Um, and um, so I'm looking forward. It's actually part of let's say it's, it's you know it's a, the second part of. Of the first book in some in some way, um, and I'm I'm looking forward to to discussing that book with, with people as well. Yeah, I also include a link to PM Press and your book, uh, thank you. um, and the show notes. So thank you so much for coming on, and uh, I I learned um, a lot, and I hope my audience did too. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and and for the for the good discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>